Um, so folks, I'm gonna get spotlighted real quick. Ooh. Yeah, well, maybe, hopefully y'all aren't seeing a split screen. Um, one thing y'all is uh, I will be definitely all over the chat during the session. So feel free to drop any questions or comments in there. But the reason we are here, and let me know also if you can't see me clearly or we're getting too much split screen, we can figure that out. But for now, um, we are here because we're gonna talk about this thing called the business model canvas. And you may have heard of it, you may have not. So before I even start explaining it, I'm gonna talk about like, why do we actually care? How can this thing benefit us? So let's jump into this and I'm gonna give you a little bit of backstory on, on everything that we're gonna to hit today. So, so folks, uh, this is me. This is me in a room teaching entrepreneurs because that is something that, well, we used to do in the rooms and we're just now starting to get back to doing this in rooms again, right? We're, doing live teaching. But so much the pandemic, we couldn't do this. And so really the world I invested in was basically reconfiguring my entire business to teach this kind of work online over Zoom and making it engaging. And I am personally waging a war against boring Zooms. So I hope this is interesting and entertaining for y'all. But that's a little bit of my backstory. Um, I'm four-time founder. The first two companies failed. My third one worked. My fourth one is looking pretty good. We're in the middle of it. It's probably a little early to call it a success, but I'm, I'm loving it so far. But I also teach entrepreneurship at the University of Texas at Austin. And I do it just because I'm really, really passionate about this. And I take a very action-oriented approach. And that's the thing I'm going to want you all to consider about today. Uh, but I'm best known in the Austin and the Texas community for starting a company called Three Day Startup, which is an international entrepreneurship program. And I basically spent 10 years taking this from a student group in Austin to... You know, we run programs in 60 different countries all over the world, including Singapore. So including you know, some of the countries where some of y'all are coming from, we definitely run programs in Mexico City too. But uh, just a couple of things. Yeah, we're doing a uh, meeting, we're doing webinars, so we don't need to do this too much. But yeah, I just want to mention that we are going to, I'll be checking the chat if you have any questions, anything like that. Um, but okay, y'all, uh, let's get into it. In the, the seminal paper, Untangling the Concept, no, okay. If anyone ever tries to teach you entrepreneurship by reading a academic research journal at you, you should just leave the room, okay? That is not what we are gonna do today. Nothing is going to really speak to that, all right? We're gonna focus on what can we learn by doing and what can we learn from our own experience. Research papers, even books. I'm gonna recommend some good books, but generally speaking, that's a topic that the best way to learn entrepreneurship is by doing entrepreneurship, even if you don't know what that means. And I want to let you all in on a secret. A lot of entrepreneurs, they don't know what they're doing either. They're just as confused and feeling lost as the rest of us. What they have is a bias towards action. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to talk about the business model canvas for a little bit. And then we're going to open up the Q&A. And we're going to like, see what else we can explore. But let me get into this. So let's say that you have a desire to start a company. Who, it doesn't really matter why. Maybe because you want to be your own boss. Maybe because you want to get yacht money. <laughs> Maybe because you want to uh, do work that can impact the lives of many people, that you want to help lots of people through the products and services that you build. Honestly, business is such an amazing way to do good in the world. It's also a great way to build a nice life, right? So this slide right here, it shows what we kind of, if we haven't started the company before, what we think it looks like. Well, we start and we just follow this path. It's just, you know, we just take it up. But the thing is, it's not a straight line. And what actually ends up happening is that for most first time entrepreneurs, the road to success looks a little bit more like this. It's a little bit more winding and all over the place. They're still figuring it out. It's not clear. And that's why the business model canvas is so powerful is what it does is it changes the, the nature of the entrepreneurial journey. So instead of looking like this, it doesn't look like this, but it looks like this. And if you look at this chart, what this shows is, well, you've got your starting point and you're trying different things. Some of them work, some of them don't. Again, it's not just we do everything right and it's a straight line up and to the right and everything's golden. If we want to start a company, we're uncertain and we're not quite sure what we're doing. So what we do is we run experiments, we run tests. The business model canvas gives us a structure for thinking about that. 
a way to do these tests intelligently, a way to know what should we explore, what should we experiment with, right? So that's one of the reasons why this stuff matters. Another thing is that the business model canvas is it's useful for any place you are in the business creation process. You could be at the very beginning, you just got an idea and you think you wanna explore it, or it can be useful if you're an executive at a Fortune 500 company, you know exactly what the goals are. This tool is still useful for that. It can still provide order for that. So real quick, I'll talk about what a canvas actually is. A canvas is a one page document. Uh, again, it's a canvas and something that draws your focus to specific parts of starting a business. So entrepreneurship is complicated and it can be kind of fuzzy. It draws your attention to specific parts of what to focus on. These loops here, but they, that's meant to show that it's a little bit iterative, right? It goes, it has ups and downs and it's something that you'll repeat. I can explain that a little bit more deeply um, by way of a metaphor about barbecue, because honestly, barbecue is a wonderful metaphor for anything. But this gentleman right here, Aaron Franklin, he's the godfather of barbecue in Austin. And he says, well, the, the secret to making great barbecue is that you have to make lots of bad barbecue. You gotta make barbecue that you're trying your best, but it just doesn't turn out that well. And in that process, again, that's where the learning comes from. It's not something where you sit and think about barbecue, it's that you make it. And some of your early results aren't as great as you'd like them to be. That's what the business model canvas is like. You can fill it out a ton of different times. You fill it out and if it's going great, awesome. But if, it's, if your answers are weak, you would crumple it up and just throw that piece of paper away, right? Um, it's iterative. It's going to improve and evolve over time. Other thing that a canvas does is it gives you order. It's a one-page document that contains all the complexity of the business in one page. Now, certainly it's not like a Bible of the entire thing. It doesn't tell you every single detail, but it lets you know what to think of and what to focus on. And so the confusion that we can feel about, well, what should we be doing? What do we do next? A canvas can help you do that. So, uh, interestingly, what canvases also do is they point us towards action. I'm going to say this a lot, but entrepreneurship is not a, a cerebral process. There's a saying that, well, the grade A students in school are managed by the B students who end up working for companies that are owned by the C students, right? Entrepreneurship, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. What you need to be is a person of action. And Herb Kelleher, who, you know, the minor program is named after, who funded this program and is a great role model. Well, he was a person of action. He was in a board meeting once and someone said, well, can you talk about the strategic plan of doing this? And he, he just wasn't having it. And he said, listen, we have a strategic plan. It's called doing things. And what that points to is, again, the sooner you act, the more learning you get. And the more learning you get, the quicker you get to the correct answer and the correct outcome. You don't need to write more research. You don't need to read more books about it. You need to just take action. And as long as those actions you take aren't fatal to your company, you're in good shape. And this is a concept that Herb Kelleher understood really, really well. Canvases, they point you to action. They help you be more like him, okay? Um, another thing that is kind of an unseen benefit of this tool, this one page document, is that it helps bring to light certain elements of the business that are the most noteworthy, the most, the most juicy tidbits of the entire process. So it brings you talking points. A key part of you know, any sort of entrepreneurial venture is how you talk about it. And in other sessions, we'll talk about pitching and how, how you pitch an idea is sometimes more important than the actual idea itself that you're pitching. But what a business model canvas does is it brings things to light. It brings up certain points that you can find that resonate with your customers and the people that matters. So canvases are just really, really powerful tools. And there's something worth thinking about if you're trying to build a business. Because otherwise, sometimes we're not quite sure what to talk about. What we're seeing is the blinking cursor staring back at us, not really telling us much about what to do, right? So um, what do you do if you don't do a canvas? What, what have people done in the past? Well, you do something called a business plan. And this is a bit of a religious argument. There are some people in the entrepreneurship game who really deeply believe in business plans. I think those people are wrong. I don't think they know what they're talking about. I think that business plans are documents that nobody reads. 
business plans are lengthy strategic documents that explain the the, the cycle of business and how it's going to work and its strategic uh, opportunities and its weaknesses and all these different things involved in the business process, which they're beautiful words to string together and they sound good, but I'm not really sure that that's going to be of use. The thing about a business plan is it's a snapshot of the business at a current time and times are changing, right? If you had a business plan on 2019 in early 2019, and the pandemic hits, that whole business plan just completely evaporates into nothing. It's no longer valuable. It was a canvas. Yeah, it might evaporate, but you didn't, you just did some thinking on it. You throw it away and you start another one. It moves much, much quicker per the points that I emphasized earlier, right? So business plans, I think they're a little bit outdated. I think this tool that we're going to use, the business model canvas or any other canvas for that matter, it's much more valuable for you to center your knowledge and reduce risk, right? Entrepreneurship, there can be some risk involved in it. It can be scary. Some of y'all are students and you're nervous about starting a company. Some of y'all have a day job that you do and you like it. You don't, you, you don't like doing that job. You want to go start a venture, but it feels risky. And there's, I mean, there's risks in having a job too. Now you're beholden to what your boss thinks. Of you. But the point is a canvas will help you reduce risk. Business plans, less so. So another way to think about this is just as by way of a metaphor. This image right here, this is a 1980s spaceship. This is the launch infrastructure. This is heavy duty. This is a lot. This takes a lot of time to set up. And it goes to this one big push, this one single launch. A canvas is a little bit different. A canvas is something you can just fill at once. If it's good, great. You can make edit, but you're constantly evolving and iterating it. And you're reusing your thinking. So a canvas is a little bit more like this, more like Tesla, right? We've got NASA and Tesla, right? Old school NASA, you can use it once. Horrendously expensive, lots of time, investment, energy. Canvas, much more lightweight, reusable. You can even do multiples of them, right? That's why this is a better tool. So let's get into it. Here's the canvas itself. You can find it by Googling it. So you don't need to look too hard. But as you can see, it's a grid that maps out these different things. I'm going to show you all some different elements of what's inside it and how to structure them. Here's an example of a completed canvas, okay? Um, this is for Netflix. So what this canvas is doing is answering, how would Netflix, that organization, complete the business model canvas? You can see different things, right? In the far right, we've got this customer segments piece, and it's talking about how they have segmented their customer base, how they divide them. We've got their customer relationships, like how, what is the nature of that connection to their customers? How does that happen? Channels, value props. I'm going to go through all this stuff, but I wanted to share this just as an example of that. And if you need to see a reference, here's another one. This is for Khan Academy. And if you don't know Khan Academy, they're a wildly popular site that creates learning content so that you can get, you can see right here in this value prop, the high quality education for everyone for free. That's what the Khan Academy is aiming for. And this is how they would complete it. And it's a little bit more simple, right? You can see this kind of post-it note format here. But I wanna walk y'all through the canvas, okay? So, and I'm gonna be a little expansive and a little rolling. Um, looks like we still got, wow, lots of people, awesome. Um, again, feel free to drop questions in the chat if you'd like to, if you have anything that you're, you're curious about. But I'm gonna just again, talk to y'all a little bit about what, what are we seeing, okay? so. Let's first, let's talk about the customer segments. And I wanna speak a little bit more broadly about customers. So if you are an early stage entrepreneur, one of the things you need to do is you need to go talk to your customers. And you need to go do something called a customer interview, which I'm sure they'll, if they haven't covered already, they'll cover more in this series. Here's the problem with customer interviews is we have to talk to the right people. One of the early mistakes that people make when they're talking to customers is they talk to their family. And here's the thing, your family, they are wonderful people. Your friends, your family, they love you and they support you. But you actually can't trust their advice. You can't trust their advice because they're biased. They know you and they love you. Notice, however, that I have not covered up the child's face. If you have ever interfaced, interacted with a kid before, <laughs> kids have no filter. They don't care. So kids will tell you if your idea sucks. But your mom and your dad won't. And who we want to talk to in the early stage process of gathering this information is talking to the people who are going to give you money your customers, right? Their advice, their perspective, the words that you hear from the people who are gonna buy what you do matter more than anything. 
So when you're filling up that business model canvas and we're dealing with this first phase here, this customer segment, this piece is who is your customer? That's who you want to identify. You want to be very careful about that. Quick uh, statement is that if you're a company that makes shoes, the answer to the question, well, our customer segment, it's just people who wear shoes, people who have feet, not a good answer. That could be everyone. We want to be much more specific, right? We want to be women, 18 to 34, who are free-spirited, live in major urban centers on the East Coast, right? We want to be very, very specific, demographically clear about who that is. Okay, um, next up, the customer relationships, which is not actually, we're saying, what is the shape of those relationships? Like, how do you interface with them? Is it through your website? Is it through, um, do you have an app? What is it that makes the connection between you and your customers, okay? Um, next up, we've got the channels, which is how do they buy your stuff? So not just the communication, but where do they buy it? So in this box, you would write in, how do they, like, how do they reach your stuff? So let's, here's a, a good example of, um, so Michaela Ulmer, let's wait for this slide. I don't know if you'll know her. She's like big deal, teenage entrepreneur, sort of a company called Me and the Bees Lemonade. And this, this company has become wildly successful. And she's a, a local Texan, but she sells lemonade. And so the channel by which people reach her is through retail stores. So for her, it wouldn't be DTC. DTC means like direct to consumer. That's like people don't buy a lot of their website. I don't think they buy lemonade on her website. Most of the way that people get her product is through going to a retail store. So that's the channel that she has to go through, okay? Um, so next up, let's talk about the value propositions. And the value propositions, see how that's this big column right in the middle? This is actually the most important piece of this entire thing. This is about what is the value that we create? Uh, value is kind of a not cool sounding word. So I like to explain this in depth. Value is what is the benefit you're giving to someone? What is, why do they even care? Like, like why would they care about your business? What does your product give them? For a, a, you know, a, Coke, a can of Coke, it might be that it's refreshing, whether it gives you a little hit of caffeine, right? That's the value that you get. And different products can have different value propositions, but generally speaking, you want to hone in on one. Um, so just to go a little bit deeper on this, like to think about value and customers, Kendra Scott, you know, massively famous jewelry company. Well, they have, you know, what is the value? Well, if you're a young woman who buys some earrings from Kendra Scott, well, the value you get is you get to feel good. You get to know that you look good. You get to feel glamorous. You get to have something that matches well with your ensemble or that sort of thing. That's the value that's being created. Who receives it? Well, her, the buyer. Who pays for it? She does. She's the customer and the user, right? Customers are people who pay for products. Users are people who sometimes pay for it, but regardless, they're receiving the value. So here's another example. Think about Instagram, right? Uh, you and I, we're users of Instagram. When we get on Instagram, well, the value we get is we get to see interesting stuff. We get to you know, know what's going on with our friends. We get to laugh at funny jokes. We get to figure out what's going on with bands we love or influencers we like or creators, whatever. But who's receiving value? Well, yeah, it's us, but it's also the people who buy ads. The people who buy ads, those are the customers for Instagram. Because unless we're buying ads, we're not a customer, we're a user of Instagram. The customer is the one who buy ads and they get value from it in the sense that someone might go buy their product because of it. And then finally, who pays for it? Well, that's them, it's those buyers. So just to show you one more dimension of this is that sometimes the user and the customer, that relationship can be a little different, right? Think about it, the user of a child car seat, well, that's the kid, the kid you strap in the car. But that kid isn't buying the car seat, the parent's buying it. So that kid gets the value of safety and feeling comfortable. The parent gets the value of knowing that their child's gonna be safe. The baby is receiving it, but they're also receiving it in a way, but they also pay for it, right? So it's just useful to think about value in this context. And that's why I wanted to go a little bit deeper on. Um, okay, next up, we've got key activities. And key activities mean, what do you do? So what are the things that you spend your time doing? Let's look at a good old example here of a taco truck. Taco trucks, key activities. Well, it has to acquire ingredients. It needs to cook those ingredients. It needs to make sure that its Yelp presence is okay. When it's running special, it needs to update its menu. All these activities that are core parts that make the business run. Those are the key activities of a taco truck, right? And they're not always as obvious as we would think. Um, there, there's, a, there's a wide range of things that we need to keep in mind. It's not just making the customer happy, right? Um, next up, let's get into like key resources. This refers to like the assets. 
what does the company have? And it could be something from you know, warehouses, it can be finance, like money in the bank. It could be a small business loan. It could be brand, right? Think about how valuable a brand is. And just, you know, Coca-Cola is a globally dominant brand and we know what Coke is. And that name recognition is worse than even that is an asset. Um, Google, the page rank algorithm, what it used to run SEO. That's, that's an algorithm. Oh, that's a, an asset that is also a key resource. Things like Redbox, right? One of Redbox's key resources is that they have this machine that they have built that allows you to rent uh, DVDs. I mean, I'm still in business, still doing well. I want to tell you guys something really important about Redbox. One of like the wildest stories about how they got started. Think about that key resource that we're looking at right there, that red box, that machine. Building, designing, prototyping that machine was crazy expensive. And so the founders of Redbox did something really, really smart before they invested the you know, tens and 20s, 30s, $40 million in prototyping that machine. What they did was they didn't know if people were going to be up for renting a DVD from a convenience store, from a 7-Eleven or a Circle K. So what they did was they built a simple software interface. They just put a touchscreen monitor outside there and had people, they'd go find, you know, whatever, they'd find Finding Nemo and they'd rent that. But they just had the touchscreen, just the software piece. They didn't build that machine that spit out the DVD because that would have been so expensive to do. What they had was some very, you know, weekly, very poorly paid guy who just sat in the back of the convenience store with a big case of DVDs next to him. And when that person rents Finding Nemo, the guy would just go grab it, run outside and hand the person their DVD. That's what they did in the early stages because it was so much less expensive to test this offering this way than it was before. We gotta remind ourselves, right? This was not normal. There's a lot of businesses where what, what happens now is normal. Like right now with Uber, it's very normal. They get in the back of a stranger's car and drive somewhere. At one point, this was a wild idea. Same thing with Airbnb, which is even weirder. Go sleep in a stranger's, you know, random bedroom, right? These were things that people didn't do and they weren't really sure it was going to work. Redbox was one of those things. No one was sure if someone would actually rent a DVD outside of a convenience store from a machine, but they did. And they did it by doing that very inexpensive test. Okay, so uh, let's see. Key partners. This, these are the, the relationships that are important to make this business work. So it can refer to like the channel relationships. I talked about Michaela Ulmer and her lemonade. She has to have relationships with those stores to sell this stuff. Let's say you are in biotech and you want to, you know, you're, want to do a new drug. You need to get your drug approved by the FDA, right? You got to, um, the FDA needs to sign off and say, this is okay for you. To, you need that approval to be able to sell that in the United States. That is a partner relationship that you're maintaining, Okay. Um, cost structure. This just refers to how much does this cost? And again, when you're completing this canvas, you don't need to, you don't need to speak to the costs, right? You don't, like, you don't need to give the actual numbers. You can just talk about what's the larger, what are those costs? Because it's very hard for us to guess. Um, anonymous attendee gives a great question. I'm going to hit that question when I finish this final box. So revenue streams, what that refers to is how does money come in? And again, we don't need to guess like how much money we'll make. We want to make guesses about that, but that's not for the canvas. The canvas is to guess how did those come in? And the nature, the shape of that can change. So remember, Netflix, right? In the early days, you would rent specific DVDs or you could just have this package where you rent things and, and they would mail a DVD to you. But DVDs changed pretty soon. Well, actually it took forever. It took way longer than we thought. It took much, much longer for... DVDs to get outmoded and for us to just enter the streaming era. So businesses change over time and the revenue streams, those may very well change as well. Netflix, eventually Netflix content that gets made by Netflix is going to get sold to other TV stations who aren't, you know, broadcast television. That's a business model that was not a revenue stream. That's a, the way that money came to the company that was not part of the early days, but it is part of their future. So these things will change. Okay. So let's talk about some of these questions before I kind of get into closing thoughts on a couple of things. Um, so one person asks, what's the difference between the lean canvas and the business model canvas? Pros and cons. They're both fantastic and they're both useful. A lot of them are gonna ask some of those same things. Like for example, both of them ask about customer segment. Who is the group of people you serve? I think they also both speak to the value proposition. They speak to money coming in, 
But the lean canvas is based on the lean startup. The lean startup is a methodology that defines a startup in a certain way. There's basically two definitions of a startup from that perspective. One is that it is a temporary organization in search of a business model. So let's say that we love tacos and we're going to start a taco truck and that's what we're going to do. And that's just it. It's a taco truck and that's what we're going to do. That's not a startup. That is a business that is static. A startup is a temporary organization. It's going to change and grow. And so it's going to start in one phase, but growth is what matters. The lean canvas is based on, is, is built for organizations aiming for rapid growth. The other thing about a lean startup is that it's, and startups in general is that we refer to them as human institutions. And that's a reminder to say that while startups tend to involve technology and growth, at the end of the day, most of business, it's not really numbers, it's people. And it refers to how we get smart people in and around the business to make that work. But to answer your question again, the Lean Canvas is built for earlier stage, more startup oriented. Using the Lean Canvas with a, a Fortune 500 company wouldn't be as straightforward as it would to use the, the business model canvas, okay? So that's that, um, let's see. And by the way, y'all, I love these questions, so keep them coming. So Farouk asks, why was this word used and what is the meaning in this context? And the word he's referring to is canvas. Well, again, I think canvas, because when you think of like, if you're an artist, a painter, and you paint a painting on a canvas, that is, it's a contained surface. That canvas, whatever size it's gonna be, is always gonna be that size. Whereas a business plan, a plan is a document with a bunch of pages. That can be five pages, it could be 50 pages, it could be 100 pages, right? That thing can get really, really long and get unwieldy. And by unwieldy, meaning hard to read, and hard to manage. Let's say that your business changes, which by the way, y'all, your business is always going to change. It never is going to become reality, right? It's never gonna come into reality exactly how you thought it was. The distance between an idea in your mind and your executed business is wildly different. And every company I've ever started has said that. So the thing about it is that if that's the case and you need to update your business model, how you're thinking about it, well, then you gotta go find, okay, page seven, third paragraph, I need to fix that, make sure that the spelling and the grammar is right, make sure the tone fits in with that whole thing. That's slow. The canvas is a single page document. We just quickly jot it down. And again, we don't rewrite a canvas. What we do is we just crumple it up, throw it in the trash, and then do another one. So it's much more iterative. Mom, and one more kind of way to drive that home is think about, there's a saying about SaaS products and software. Is that software, well, it's, it's never really finished right? Software can always be updated. And that's kind of how the business model is. It can always be, the business model canvas can always be updated and changed much more easily than other documents. Cool. Um, so those two questions, y'all, I would love to hear any more y'all have, and I could tell some other stories. Um, what I'd want to know is, like, let's do, one thing I'd like to do actually be a chat storm real quick. And a chat storm is when we're all going to, we're all gonna hit enter in the chat at the same time and see what everyone thinks. So here's what I wanna take a quick pulse on is what I wanna know is where y'all are. I wanna know if you're at the idea stage, like I have an idea or I don't have an idea. I am just curious. I just wanna learn an idea. I mean, an idea for a business. So if, you have an idea, your answer to this prompt is gonna be, I have an idea. If you don't, it's gonna be, nope, no, I don't have an idea. So I'm gonna give you all five seconds to type this in on the count of three, we're all gonna hit enter at the same time and we're gonna have a waterfall in the chat. We're gonna just have this raining down of we'll see who's got ideas and who doesn't, okay? All right, just another minute or two. Say, I have an idea, if you don't, or if you do have an idea, if you have a business idea, say, I have an idea. If you don't, I want you to say, I don't have an idea. All right. One, two, three. Let it rip, y'all. Okay. All right. Looks like we're pretty split. Um, okay. All right, y'all, because I can go a couple different arenas. I can go in, how do you find a good business idea? We can talk about that. And we can talk about 
you know, what's useful is the business model canvas. If you have an idea, this is the first thing you should do. Well, actually there's a couple things you could do, but if you, if you already have an idea, I would grab the business model canvas and try to complete it for them right then and there. I would go download it on the internet and try to fill it out. And some parts of that will seem easy. Some parts of that will be hard. And then you can do is you could also show this to other entrepreneurs and ask for their feedback on it. But as I mentioned, completing that, uh, that business model canvas for your idea will help you find the strengths and weaknesses of it based on those things, okay? Um, for those of you who don't have an idea, here's what I would tell y'all. I'm assuming that you're at the position where you're, there's something about starting your own business that's attractive to you, whether it's money, whether it's, it's just because it's a fun thing to do because you want to benefit humanity, because you want to get rich and famous, like who knows, right? But if you don't have an idea, one thing that's really important is to just turn on your lens to think about this. So a story that I'll tell you all about this is there's this famous study from a professor at Cornell, and he talks about opportunity recognition and about our ability to see opportunities in front of us. Because I like thinking about this a lot. Like, for example, Uber, the founders of Uber, they were watching a James Bond movie, Casino Royale. And there was a scene in Casino Royale, uh, James Bond was holding up his phone, and there was like some interface where it showed a car moving along the street, kind of a GPS interface. And these two guys, they saw it and they're like, huh, what if you could get a taxi that way? That movie sparked the idea for Uber. They saw something, it sparked an idea, they went and did it. So like ideas can come from strange places. But this study, well, these guys had that ability to see, you know, they're open-minded enough to kind of know this stuff. But they gave this study, they, this professor gave some a group of five college students a basketball. He said, I want you to pass this basketball around in a circle. I want you to count every pass. And so they started passing them around and, uh, you know, they're like one, two, three. And eventually like in one minute, they do 143 passes. And then the professor says, did you notice anything, anything unusual during this experiment? And they're like, no, no, but we got 143 passes. What happened was a man in a gorilla suit ran through, right through the middle of that group of people. And they didn't notice because they were too focused on their goals. Opportunity recognition. This is a key trait in the entrepreneurial mindset, being able to see opportunities, see where there might be an opportunity to make something. And a good way to think about this is, problems like where are people experiencing problems and just having a action bias mindset i'm going to end on a story that ties to that but there's a great question from catherine so i want to touch on this um catherine says i have two successful startups and two unsuccessful how do you assess when the business is unsuccessful you know for example when you run out of money can't get funded no customers um is selling it or merging it considered successful or is it sometimes a way of selling off good parts of an unsuccessful business Catherine, that kind of depends on how long you've been going but generally speaking i think success is if it has been making money for an extended period of time so two or three years making a profit i don't think you need to have an exit to be successful and one thing is that not all exits are created equal deal terms for exits aren't always super clear so there's a thing called an aqua hire right there are people who sell companies to Google. And what's really happening is they're not, like what's funny is these people, they go get jobs as product managers at Google. And what happens is that Google is buying their company, but they don't really care so much about the IP. What Google cares about is getting the key personnel. And the key personnel is gonna sign an agreement that says we'll stick there for a year or two or three or whatever. But a lot of times the size of that acquisition is about the same size as a starting salary at Google. So what the founder gets is they can say, oh, I sold my company to Google, but really they just got a, you know, they just got a job at Google because what might've been happening is that they were running out of money. So ultimately this definition is very personal, but that's my definition. I'd be curious to what yours is, but the thing about so much of business is just surviving that you don't need to be, you know, upping your revenues 10 X a month, right? You don't need to have your monthly active users exploding all this stuff. Like that's all wonderful. But every day that you keep the business alive is one more day where there's an opportunity for something good to happen. And so the third business I started called Three Day Startup, which I'm no longer a part of, but is still around doing fine. They got a you know, big presence at, at UT. Um, we, you know, I ran that business for 10 years. I was the CEO founder for a decade. And there's work we did in the first two or three years that six, seven years later, we were getting recognition for. So someone who heard about what we did four years ago, reaching out and saying, hey, we love this project you did. We heard this project you did in Korea. We heard about this big uh, deal you did in Australia that helped these universities grow some programs. We'd like to work to you. 
And if the, we had quit the business, we wouldn't have had access to those opportunities. So like the longer you can last, the better. Um, but Catherine, it's, it's very much a personal thing. The other thing that's really unique about the United States, y'all, is that you can fail upwards. And what I mean by fail upwards, meaning that my first business, uh, it failed. What we were building was SoundCloud for sports commentary. I get really annoyed when I watch sports commentary and the two color commentators are bad. They're not interesting or they're tell, calling the game in a boring way. I want to hear more variety in the same way that YouTube completely democratized video. When you can make videos about anything on YouTube compared to broadcast television. I wanted the same thing for sports commentary. So my first company was called RookieCast. We started this and we wanted, again, SoundCloud's full of like amateur rappers, right? We wanted amateur sports commentators to use this platform and we could hope find the next generation of commentators. That was really cool, but we could not figure out the business model and the company failed. We couldn't raise money. I became known in Austin as the, the, the sports commentary tech guy. And this opened up a lot of doors for me, much more interesting doors than if I had just gotten, I actually got offered my dream job at a, a startup accelerator. And if I'd worked there, that would have been fine, but I would just wanted one guy working at a startup accelerator. By having this startup, even though it failed, it got me interesting conversations. I met great people. Um, and that's one of the cool things being a founder is it opens lots and lots of doors. So you fail upwards. The other thing I wanna to recommend to you jokers is y'all, most of y'all are students. And if you're students, you have what's called the student card. The student card, of course, is not a literal thing. It's a figurative concept. What it means is that when you're in school, what the world expects of you is very little. It expects you to not fail out of school. But if you start a company and it has some success while you're in school, that's just gravy. That's just a bonus. If the company fails, no one's like, oh, you idiot. They're like, oh, you're a college kid. You know, like they weren't even expecting it to happen in the first place, but the learning you'll get will be tremendous. And something I strongly recommend is every once in a while, there's an opportunity to do some independent studies where you ask a professor, hey, I've got this business idea. I want to make it real. Uh, can I have a class where I don't do any real homework? All I do is build this business and you check in on my progress every once in a while. I don't know if there's programs like that now, but they, they tend to be also a lot of times it's helpful to tend to ask for them, which is also very much the entrepreneurial mindset is to ask, hey, could I do this? But if I were you and I had a business idea, I would be trying to convince a, a professor of mine, hey, can I try to build this business over a semester? You be my advisor, you know, and I'll, I'll give you progress updates. But then you get to build your business and you get to get learning and you don't have to take some class that maybe isn't really useful or aligned, right? I, I love universities. I love higher ed. There's a lot of nonsense for learning this stuff. Best way to learn this stuff is by doing it. Starting a company and failing it is way better for instruction than it is for reading a great book on the subject. Um, there's a, a founder named Sahil Levingia, who I admire a lot. He started a company called Gumroad that is a fairly massive company. They've helped uh, like 50 million creators re, uh, make almost half a billion dollars, right? It's, a, it's focused on the creator economy, which I don't know if y'all are into the creator economy, but it's something that's pretty powerful. The idea that all of us, we have access to do this kind of great work. Um, and make videos, make content to grow whatever it is we do. And he says that the way startups work and the way entrepreneurship works is it's not you learn things and then you start. It's that you start things and then you learn. And the reason I think this is so important for y'all is we tend to like all of education has been telling us, oh no, we need to study and research and make sure we know everything. And once we know everything, then we can take action. And it's backwards. Okay. This is an important point. I want y'all to get started and learn along the way. Don't, you're never going to get a point where you feel like you know it perfectly. And guess what? If you do, you're kidding yourself. Um, all right. So I want to make sure we don't have any more questions. I want to share one closing story. Well, you have to make sure like last call for questions. What do y'all want to know about? Um, let's give a second for that. And then I want to give a closing story and tell you how to find it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hit me up. We do have a few questions in the Q&A uh, oh, cool. box there, Cam. Okay. Yeah. Let me check that real quick. Because um, I think we, oh, the open one. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong tab. All right, let's hit these. Um, if you just have an idea, shouldn't you still use lean payments? Yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. I would definitely, if you have an idea, exactly. That's, yeah, totally. So that's definitely, that's, uh, that's awesome. Okay, next up. Um, uh, yes, I'll hit your other question. Yasser asks, um, how can you afford starting businesses and failing and still pay the bills? That's the challenge, right? I want y'all to be, 
um, you need to be very, very careful. You want to, part of entrepreneurship is risk management and risk management is tough. You want to never do anything that could pull the business under. So you want to just be cognizant of your costs and you want to get very, very scrappy. You want to find ways to test the business out that don't cost lots of money. What does that mean? Well, one of the best ways to test a business out is to go interview potential customers. That doesn't cost anything. That's sending people an email and having a Zoom conversation with them where you interview them and understand what is the pain they're feeling. Because I want to tell y'all, it's not about our solution. Customers don't care, not important to them. What customers care about is their problem. So go talk to customers, that doesn't cost any money. And when you do that, it's directly de-risking it. The other thing is to build a really cheap prototype. Um, I could go deeper on that, but I wanna answer some of these other questions we can move back around. Okay, so that's that. Um, let's see. Another anonymous attendee asked, would you advise using the Canvas when brainstorming new features or services for an existing company? Exactly, yes. That the business model canvas is perfect. Lean canvas, maybe not as ideal, but the business model canvas, if you want to do a new feature, a new initiative, yes, by all means, that's perfect. Definitely do that. So we've done that. All right. James Key asks, a lot of business ideas are intriguing, but there's that one key element that the whole thing will turn on. How does this can canvas help us identify that one or two key things? Well, what it does is it brings attention to the specific areas, James. So uh, the thing is, in hindsight, we can't really know that. Right. Um, one of the, my, my second business, the one that failed was we were building this thing called anniversary time capsule. And what that meant was that when a couple is engaged to be married, that's a real rosy special time. And so we wanted uh, couples to do was take out their phones and record a sweet message to each other. Like, Hey honey, I love you so much. I remember that time we got Chinese food in Brooklyn, you know, can't wait to go on this journey with you. All that lovey dovey stuff. And then they were going to put this on our website in this time capsule interface. And the message would get locked up for a year. And then a year later, the time capsule unlocks and they get this wonderful loving message from their significant other, right? Well, no one would record videos. We were beta testing this. We built the prototype, which is a mistake. We should have done more customer interviews, but we built the prototype and people just wouldn't record videos. And the reason was that 10 years ago, People recording videos on their phone, like the iPhone had just come out. So they weren't used to doing this sort of thing. It was a weird, it was a weird activity. Now there was another company that was doing the exact opposite of this. A little company called Snapchat. Maybe you've heard of them. Snapchat's innovation was disappearing content, right? They made it go away. The thing is, James, our fatal flaw is that we had just went in the wrong direction. And if we had been more thorough with our customer interviews, we might've caught it. Business model campus, it might have caught that, it might not have. What's important is that it gets you to think about the right things. Because one thing that's pretty common, James, is that when we're starting a new business, we tend to get, it's human nature to get overly interested in our website and our logo and our brand and the name of our company. Those things do not matter. They're not important, okay? Uh, you can always change those things. Your customer problem, that matters and understanding how they're gonna use it. So that's, I tell you on that, but honestly, James, it's really hard to predict this stuff. So I would use the canvas and start building the business as quickly as possible. Um, that's my advice on that. All right. So let's see. Uh, Pallavi Mishras, if you have more than one idea, ideas keep popping. Is there a framework you would recommend for which one to go for? Yeah, um, I can tell you what I would recommend, Pallavi. Um, it's the outside in framework. I've got a slide for this. And also Bill Kleinbecker asked if I'm in a state prison, which yes, clearly I'm in prison. Um, so thank you. Uh, they, they let me out to do this. So that was really fun. Um, I'm also joking, I am not in prison, uh, but I'm glad you like the background. All right, let's answer Pallavi's question. I wanna show this inside out framework real quick about how to choose an idea. So, Having too many ideas, by the way, is a great problem to have. Um, so congrats, like you wanna do that, that's good. The way to find the best idea is not by thinking really hard on one idea, it's by coming up with tons of ideas and then picking the best ones. So I think what y'all can see right now is this slide that says, how do you decide which idea to work on? So you wanna think about something called problem founder fit. And what that means is you are like when, Products become wildly successful. They have what's called product market fit. 
product market fit means that you're perfectly aligned so that the product that you have is completely aligned with the market. These products skyrocket and explode and are wildly successful. But that's something to think of further down the road. Earlier on, you wanna think more of what are you well attuned to fit? And if you look at this Venn diagram here, there's two layers. There's one where like what you like to do, what you're excited about, what's internally to you, what you're passionate about. And then there's the, what do customers want? What do customers need? So the way to pick one is what are you, like I would not pick one based on, don't pick an idea based on what you think will make the most money or don't pick one based on you like crypto and crypto is cool right now. What you want to do is pick like, what did you, I mean, if, if you love crypto, then yes, but you want that alignment to be, if you're in that middle spot of the Venn diagram, that sweet spot of the, the, what you love to do and what other people care about. Because if you work on just what you care about, then you're an artist, then you're interested in self-expression, which is fine, but go take an art class. If you just care about what customers need and you don't have any passion for it, you're going to run out of inspiration. Inspiration is a fuzzy, soft word. It sounds kind of silly, but honestly, you need inspiration and you need motivation. And if you're passionate about something, then that's going to fuel you to go on. Every time I explain this, someone always says, well, Cam, I'm not really passionate about anything. I have nothing I'm interested in. And I say, well, all right, like if that's the case, just start something. And when you start something, you will find out if you if you love it or not, okay? That's typically how that works. Um, all right, so founder problem fit and try to find the middle of the diagram, Pallavi, that's what I would do. Make a big list. And the other thing is there's nothing saying you can't do these in parallel too. As long as you're at the ideal level, you can talk to tons of customers, prospective customers about each idea and see which one works. And one of them is gonna pick up scene, right? So that'd be the advice I'd give you. All right, y'all, um, before we wrap up, I wanna give two things. I want to just end on a point that's really, really important. Okay, um, so let me let me bring up this slide. And this closing thought is really about what to, to take away with business model canvas and kind of why we care. Um, so in the '70s, there was this very unique time when the planets were literally aligned. What was happening was the orbit of Jupiter, let me get this slide up. Um, hold on, I'm getting a little, a little resistance from the slides. All right, I'm just gonna tell the story. So the planets, we're in perfect alignment. And they were in alignment so that we could send a satellite further off in the space than we ever could before. Just having to do with like the gravity of these different planets. NASA realized this was a major opportunity. And so what they did was they said, well, we should use this to send a satellite because we can send a satellite further than any human object had ever been sent. And NASA realized this, started designing the satellite because it was gonna create all this value, this learning, this knowledge, and what possibility to send this satellite far in space. Well, Carl Sagan, an astronomer, he and his team realized if anything is going to meet aliens, well, this could be it, right? If anything is going to encounter aliens, this is it. This is the thing where it's going to go into space and we finally could have interstellar communication. So they spent all this time working on this idea. And they end up coming with something called the golden record. And the golden record is pictured here. It's literally made of gold. And they encoded all this information about humanity on it. Look at this image, right? It's got um, depictions of the earth, of science, of music, all these things that are important to humanity. It spent all this time on it. And they sent it out into space. Deep, deep space. In 2005, a company called YouTube got started and allowed for me to play the very first video uploaded to YouTube. All right, so here we are in front of the uh, elephants. And 
cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. So, the golden record, zero views. This nonsensical statement about what's unique about an elephant saying it has a trunk has been seen 175 million times. We can over plan and over prepare to try to make sure everything's right about our idea and then we send it off. But more often than not, nothing comes back. We need the courage to just start. We just need to get on camera and speak. We need to take our idea and go talk to a customer. We just need to slap together a prototype and see what happens. This is the way. And if you'll take anything from this session today, I want you to go take action, all right? All right, y'all, that's me. Um, I'm really active on Twitter. If you have more questions, you can follow me there. I'm gonna drop my info in the chat. So boom, there's that. Um, follow me on Twitter if you wanna kind of ask more. I talk about this kind of stuff all the time. The other thing I'd recommend would be my newsletter, which is the second link in that list. My newsletter is, I talk about this, I talk about how to get good on camera, I talk about how to deliver, how to tell stories. And that's really kind of the best way to know what I have going on. Incidentally, uh, next week, I'm interviewing Sahil Lavingia, that gentleman I mentioned, the founder of Gumroad. And uh, if you join my newsletter, I'm gonna send an invite to people. And then finally, I run a course called Minimum Viable Video. You can see it right there, but it's a course that teaches, it's how entrepreneurs can learn how to be great on camera and how entrepreneurs can use video to grow their business, to find their customer, to sell to their customers, to build an audience, all this kind of thing. If you're a knowledge worker, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're, you know, have a career, being great on camera is important. So that's how you find me. It has been a pleasure to hang out with all of y'all. I wish you the best of luck on all of your ventures. And uh, I would like to give a big shout out to the Herb Keller Center and Amanda for giving me the opportunity to do this just because uh, I don't know, I'm passionate about this stuff and really excited for all y'all to have great luck on all your entrepreneurial ventures. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thanks so much, Cam. Thank everyone for joining us. Um, I learned a lot and I think our audience did too. And we appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time today to talk about this concept. I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Bye.